My name is David Bogey. I'm a professor and I'm also a blacksmith. I'm here to talk about something called quantum storytelling. Most of my life has been spent in academia, the last 30 years developing theories and practices and methods of storytelling. In the last, I'd say six years since I got into blacksmithing, I've been very interested in how storytelling is related to art and the expression of something called quantum physics. I'm going to draw a lot on the ontology work of Martin Heidegger, my own background work and working with Mikhail Bakhtin, Hannah Arndt, who uh, wrote a book on the human condition, and I'll, I'll take you through a number of D concepts, which I hope is a language to talk about quantum storytelling in art and related to quantum physics and the blacksmithing processes. And in each case, I'll talk about processes of blacksmithing so you can ground it in that whole worldhood and finding a whole self in that way. And for me, it's been an amazing journey. So I hope you enjoy it. Well, the directionality of the process is something I call quantum storytelling. And it's part of a number of Ds, but directionality, for example, with this hammer, the hammer has a particular directionality in the context of all of the equipment in that shop. And this hammer is used for particular things and it's used in a particular way. It's in terms of where it stands in the process, right? And it stands in a particular relationship to all the other tools in the shop. Now the datability or dateability is particular dates of high significance. Now, when I purchased this uh, Brent Bailey hammer, right, I bought this in 2010 at a Swaba convention. And it was a significant date for me because that's when I made a commitment to take my blacksmithing to a higher level by investing in some good tools. So it's a very dateable moment. Okay, duration has to do with time, but it's not the duration of like minutes or seconds or hours, okay? It has to do with being in the moment and you don't even notice time, right? And you can be so busy hammering and just pounding away on your anvil. And I'm in this other world. I'm in this blacksmithing world, the whole worldhood of blacksmithing. And I didn't even know that I'm married, that I'm on this planet, <laughs> you know, I'm just in that space. So that's called duration. Okay, we're talking about a disclosability of the future here. It's not a disclosability of the past like you have in narrative, where you're just going looking backwards in time and trying to figure out the past. Here I'm trying to figure out the future. Now in quantum physics, there's a particular process that I want to talk about called the spark test. And so if I was going to test this hammer face, doing a spark test to see how much carbon was in there, right? And carbon is in uh, relatively small amounts in, in the iron that you use in blacksmithing. And, but the relative amount of that carbon, you can test for that using what's called a spark test. And since they invented grinding wheels that spun and they would be able to test metal to see how much carbon content was on there. You have uh, two slits, and in, in this case it'll be metal that were made, and, you, and we're going to drive sparks through those slits at the same time. Now if, if it's a particle, we should only see two lines, two bands, right, separated a little bit. If we're getting wave effects and interference, and those sparks are interfering with each other, we might get that wave effect. Okay, destining has to do with fate or destiny. Now, instead of having a real tight fate that's deterministic, right, where you're determined to ha be this particular character and you're growing into that self, as a blacksmith, I'm interested in a weaker kind of destiny 
a destiny in, in quantum physics sense says when when you do the double slit experiment and whether it's a wave or particle both destinies are possible so somehow that bothness is a destiny in quantum physics and that's part of the destiny of the future in the moment of vision of, of seeing and interpreting what I think that blacksmithing art could look like made with blacksmithing processes. Deployability has to do with in order to, for the sake of, for the sake of which, which is real important in blacksmithing in a, in a shop. You know, you're deploying all kinds of processes for the sake of your art, for the sake of creating your art and producing the future of that art. So you need a quantum storytelling language, I think, and you need quantum storytelling processes to deal with that deployability. So you could talk about in order to, from the idea of a mechanistic physics, but you'd be in that old cause-effect language where the past determines the present. Now I'm looking at a different kind of causality of the future to the present, the future to the past, and that's a different quantum storytelling where you leave open the potential for wave and particle to both happen, right? And it's a different thinking. It's a different way of conceiving the world. It's a different way of being in the world, and that's why we're talking about this today. Uh, dwelling means there's a place for every tool in the shop, a place for this hammer. Hammer has its special place, tongs have its place. Now there's a difference in the present at hand tools in that shop and the tools that are ready to hand. In the demonstrating the forging, you saw me use a couple different hammers. Those hammers were ready to hand in that process. They were available, they were ready. I'm using them in that moment for that process. The other way that you can look at the tools in your shop is they're present at hand. Maybe they're arranged somewhat randomly. Maybe they're not used all that much. Those are present at hand, they're present in the shop, but they're not really part of the process, the creative process of the production of art. I talk about disseverance. Disseverance can happen in dissevering of time, dissevering of space, and dissevering of matter. So in a quantum storytelling, we look at disseverance not in terms of a geometric space, right? and not in terms of time that's measured out in minutes and hours. And we're not measuring the matter either in terms of some metric. Okay, in disseverance I can bring remote stuff near. In the blacksmithing world uh, there's a disseverance of this hammer because the disseverance of the hammer, the hammer has a living story of its own. I talked about the Bailey hammer, I'll give you another little chapter in that story. Once and only once did I ever let an apprentice use this hammer. And I got carried away during the demonstration in my shop. Several masters watched in horror as this Bailey hammer was welded on the anvil on a piece of iron that wasn't all that hot by an apprentice. Now the, th the reason you don't give a high quality hammer to an apprentice is they don't know how to use it, right? The reason it has to do with disseverance is because now this hammer has a particular closeness to me after I got chewed out by several master blacksmiths. One in particular came and gave me an hour lecture. Now disseverance in the art, that's an art, the quantum storytelling, this art in metal is coming my way from the future. Okay, drafts have to do with the whole auntie narrative spiral. Again, auntie means a bet. You go to Las Vegas, you make a bet, right? So this is a bet on the future. Auntie also means before. So it comes before narrative. So before narrative solidifies, petrifies, as some people call it. Now, an auntie narrative, there's two that I'm very interested in. The spiral, auntie narrative spiral, and the more rhizomatic kind of networking assemblage processes of auntie narrative. We'll just focus on the spiral in terms of drafts. 
Now there is an updraft and a downdraft, right? Uh, that we can talk about in relation to spirals. The ontology of spirals is uh, in Deleuze talks about moving to the left, it moves to the right, so there's a movement in the spiral. It has a certain directionality all its own. We've talked about directionality. Now I'll talk about drafts. Drafts are forces of the spiral, anti-narrative, and these forces can probably be attracting you upward or propelling you downward. Now, I believe there's certain choice points. We talked about destiny or destining, and you can make a choice point, a turning point, to move from one draft to the other. Okay, so if you're headed towards the abyss and things aren't going well in your blacksmithing world and you're just going down and down, it's time to get some training, it's time to get do something different about your processes so you can move over to an updraft. Uh, dispersion, something talked about in Heidegger uh, throughout his book, really. And it's not been a concept uh, studied all that much that I could find anything on. So I'm looking at the dispersion of processes. Now, towards the end of the book, Being in Time, Heidegger talks about dispersion in relation to Nietzsche. And in terms of Nietzsche's three kinds of histories. You've got your history that's antiquarian. So you're just doing things, blacksmithing from the past, you're just doing stuff in a style that has these particularities like the Spanish style of the Southwest, but you're not really getting into anything beyond that. Then you have a monumental kind of history. The monumental history is really directed more at the future and is a dispersion towards the future. Then Nietzsche had the third one, which was the critical history. And that's where you get critical about things like what happened during the conquistador taking over uh, Mexico and New Mexico, et cetera. Or you go into Europe and you look at similar kinds of phenomena there. Or you look at stuff like that around the world. OK. The eleventh process, the detaching. Uh, when it talks about um, detaching, we're into now a process where instead of evolving or developing or moving or drafting towards an authentic self, uh, with detaching we're looking at what do we need to detach that is pulling us away from that, right? So we can need to detach some processes in order to have that attraction to whatever the artistic thing that you're developing. For me, it's the quantum storytelling art. So that means how do I detach from some processes where I'm just imitating others? Uh, there's some art, and you need to do that. You need to be able to imitate the masters to get down the technique to understand how it works. But then. How do you develop your own self? How do you develop the self that's authentic in, in terms of your own artistic expression? I'm interested in how can this detachment, detaching from, away from what's called the they self. The they self is just uh, where you're imitating others, like you're imitating their style, but detaching from that allows you then to say, okay, I understand that, that draft, now can I get into another anti-narrative that's moving me in to something more authentic? You detach from dependency on those particular styles and you integrate and develop your own. And I want to say something about um, where blacksmithing came from. I mean, blacksmithing was the original alchemy. You know, you're basically working with fire, you're blowing air through Coals, coals come from the earth, iron comes from the earth. It's one of the most abundant substances on the earth. And water that you use for quenching. So these are the four elements. But there's another element, which is ether, which is a little bit more of a spiritual element. And now in the, in the quantum physics, we're rediscovering these elements in an interconnectedness, you know, and how in the quantum wave particle world, how do these elements interrelate? 
how is our own body composed of iron, iron in the blood, for example, you know? How is carbon, you know, without carbon it would be life. So I hope the 11 Ds have given you some language to work with quantum storytelling and ontological approach to storytelling as well. Break on free. One side, break on free. 